Cheesesteaks, hoagies, and pretzels have long been on the list of Philly's signature foods. But before they came on the scene, way back in revolutionary times, there was Philadelphia pepper pot soup. Pepper pot smoking hot! That was the cry of 19th century street vendors selling this African-Caribbean soup in Philadelphia. The dish that probably came over with the slave trade is rumored to have sustained Washington's troops at Valley Forge. Flavored with plenty of black pepper, tripe, and dumplings, it was cheap, hearty, and readily available. Sold up and down Market Street at the stalls. Pepper pot, pepper pot, smoking hot. Looks very rich and big carrots and big chunks of meat. So it looks very nice. At a recent festival of forgotten foods at Reading Terminal Market, Brian Sullivan tasted the soup for the first time. Oh, it's delicious. Kind of um, New Orleans. It reminds me a little bit of uh, Creole food. And I really like the, um, the meat. It's kind of smoky and nice spices. And you do know that there's uh, tripe in there, right? I haven't had tripe too many times in my life. <laughs> Jack McDavid of the Down Home Diner and purveyor of pepper pot soup says unless you're an old-timer, tripe, the stomach lining of a cow, doesn't automatically conjure up deliciousness. Well, you know, after you get over, over the, the, the initial shock, people will try it, like it. And they say, oh, it's very tender, which it is, because, you know, it's a slow cooking method that we use to make soups. So, you know, a lot of times, uh, the first time you see something or you haven't tried something, you're kind of scared of it, and you say, ooh, no. But once you try it, you like it. Pepper Pot was once the king of Philly soup and was distributed nationally by Campbell's. We ceased making Pepper Pot soup in 2010. So we made Pepper Pot here at Campbell's for over 110 years. From the very beginning, you know, it was a pickup of a Revolutionary War recipe. John Faulkner, director of brand communications at Campbell's Soup Company, says the product went out of style with other old-fashioned soups. We've been making tomato soup as long as we've been making Pepper Pot, actually a couple of years longer. But recently we created a variety of soup, Harvest Orange Tomato, using tomatoes that Campbell has developed. So we're always looking at regional, regional ideas uh, that we can bring to our, our lineup. But we also want them to be mainstream enough that there'll be general demand across the country. While the heyday of Philadelphia pepper pot soup may be gone, Jack McDavid at Down Home Diner will occasionally whip up a batch for special occasions. Still, in the art world it holds sway. Six years ago, the Andy Warhol painting of a Campbell's pepper pot soup can sold for almost $12 million. That's a lot of pepper pot. I'm Larry Roebling, WHYY News. Knives down, hands up. Shuck! The crowd came from as far away as Maine to cheer on their favorite shucker in the Oyster House's third annual Philadelphia shucking contest. Pros and amateurs competed for the glory and prizes. I've been shucking uh, professionally for about four and a half years. It takes a little dedication and skill to kind of get it to the point where you're not serving shells or breaking oysters. That's Andrew Tiny Shuttock from Philadelphia's Capitol Grill. He took the $200 grand prize and wears the prestigious gold spray-painted oyster shell medallion. But this win is only the beginning for Tiny. Think NASCAR of the bivalves. You move your way up. The more recognized you get, the better you are, the more lucrative opportunities come and that could lead to more things. There's national competitions, there's global competitions, you get sponsorships, and that's pretty much your career. While Snockies on Two Street has been around for a century, Philadelphia is enjoying a resurgence of oyster bars. Sam Mink is the proprietor of the Oyster House and created the contest three years ago. His family has been in the fish house business for three generations. At the Oyster House, it's not unusual to shuck almost a thousand oysters in an evening. And on any given night, there are at least six buck shuck happy hours in the city. But according to Dr. William Moyes Weaver, food historian and director of the Keystone Center for Regional Foods, up until the early 20th century in Philadelphia, there were oyster bars on every corner, much the same way we have pizza joints. I know from archaeology that the 18th century oysters were huge in Philadelphia because I've seen the shells. I mean, these things were monsters. could be a foot and a half across. I can't imagine an oyster that size, but... <laughs> Weaver studies hotel menus from the late 1800s that list an astonishing 30 to 40 different oyster dishes. There were oysters terrapin, cooked as if it were turtle, oysters Havana style, sautéed with hot habanero peppers, as well as pickled oysters in spicy vinegar that were available all year. 
but the one that remains today is fried oysters and chicken salad. A strange combination for sure, says Weaver. I was curious myself to figure out how this happened. If you look at the Victorian menus, businessmen's luncheons went on all day. The meals come in sort of waves like a Chinese menu. You pick out of this, you pick out of that. You'll have chicken salad and you'll have fried oysters. And there it is. Eventually, businessmen were too busy for elaborate lunches, and savvy restaurants began to combine offerings on a single platter. A chicken salad fried oyster mashup in today's parlance. Another notable aspect of the dish was how the oysters were cooked. Oh, but you know, there was a, a special technique for doing true Philadelphia fried oysters. The oysters were dried off, dipped in very fine cracker powder and then allowed to dry for 15 or 20 minutes. Then they were put down in very hot oil for a minute at most. So they were still really juicy and uh, in the middle, slightly hot in the middle, but the outside had this very, very thin, crisp shell to it. That was Philadelphia-style fried oyster. But no matter how you shuck it, Philly oysters are making a comeback. For WHYY, I'm Larry Roebling. As the midnight bell ushers in the new year, revelers in Spain and Portugal eat a grape at each strike to bring 365 days of good luck. And that's just one of the many traditions observed in Philadelphia. New Year's Day, everybody eats sauerkraut, pork, and mashed potatoes. That's Sally Schantz. The 85-year-old Fairmount resident grew up near State College, Pennsylvania. She says the tradition began in the Amish community and probably goes back to Germany. Every year she gets a delivery of sauerkraut from the Big Valley area to cook with her pork roast. And how does this make for a good year? Chickens scratch back, cows don't do anything. Pig snouts root forward, and this is supposed to mean that you are going to move forward in the new year. Emilio Magnucci, owner of De Bruno's specialty food shops, recalls a dish that will be seen in many Italian homes New Year's Day. For that day, what gets served typically, lentils, or as Italians will call it, lindique. So it's uh, stewed lentils, like like a soup, a thick soup, with cotechino cooked inside there. And cotechino is pork salami or a pork sausage that's highly seasoned with garlic and black pepper. And it was done that way because it masked some of the flavor of the odd parts of the pig that were ground into it. McNucci notes that this dish has evolved over the years. Historically, the dish was uh, lindique and zampone. And zampone is the pig's foot that's stuffed with the trimmings and pieces of the pig that were left over because they used the main portion of the pig that they were getting ready for New Year's Day also for porchetta. While the lentils are said to bring you prosperity, perhaps the dish's real benefit is a cure for the previous night's revelry, before you dig into those porchetta sandwiches. Very much so, because, you know, you would party to the wee hours, you know, ringing in the new year. Um, So you need something hearty the next day to help bring your stomach and your head back. So, yeah, absolutely, a hangover cure. And if it seems that whatever dish you've consumed isn't bringing you the desired results... There's always Chinese New Year on February 10th. Eating noodles is supposed to give you longevity. Tangerines and oranges are said to bring you wealth. I'm Larry Roebling, WHYY News. Buona sera, senorina, buona sera. It is time to say goodnight to Napoli.